as you can imagine, with friends like that and users who, uh, who are that friendly towards us, we are hugely confident of our future. But the mic of all people should take the trouble and the time from a hugely busy time to fly over here from all the way from Florence to, to be with us today is, it, it is a huge tribute and, and we, we are in a great debt. We look forward to your continuing support. I'm very grateful. What we thought we'd do to wrap up this part of the day, if we may, to give you the chance of getting back at us was to have a panel discussion, but it is not, it really is going to be to answer your questions. And I would ask, please, for, for Professor Lawrence Pu and Sio Pui Lim to, to come and join me. They need no introduction, of course, from the uh, professor. Uh, Lawrence Pu has more chairs than there are in this room. I've given up counting the universities in which he is a professor, so he'll forgive me. Uh, his huge value that he's added, uh, both on the working party one of the greatest joys that I've had since I've been working here intensively over the last 18 months, almost on a regular community basis, is that I have had the privilege of making friends at a level that I could never have hoped to from my background, to have become friends of people like Lawrence and uh, Suku has been an enormous privilege as well as a pleasure for me. Lawrence has been hugely kind to me in helping me to catch up with things I couldn't expect to understand. He was also, of course, the uh, Deputy CEO and the Registrar of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, so has worn both hats and understands that side as well. Um, uh, Sio Kui Lim needs no introduction after a spectacularly successful commercial career, almost as successful as our international squash career. The less said about the better, because if anybody ever dares to want to take her on, you're, you're in for a bit of a shock, because she, she started eating at the world champions at the age of 13, and she is formidable in every sense of the word. The, 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 the huge privilege that SIMC has is that we share our chief executive with SIAC. And that is, I think, a tribute really that could only be done in Singapore. The idea that the arbitration center should be so welcoming to mediation that it would be prepared to share its chief executive to operate, to market, and to run both companies is a formidable tribute and a debt we owe to them. Mind you, only somebody likes you possibly take on those two jobs and run as brilliantly as she does, and that only she would be the first to say because of the huge support she has from those two brilliant ladies who you've already met in, in, in Eunice and, and Francoise. So it is over to you. Uh, I, I, I'm unashamed. We were on the working party together and we, we put this thing together and we believe that we've done a very good job. We've worked very hard at it. I'm sure that there are mistakes and I know that we've got a lot to learn, but we would like to learn initially from friends like you in a reasonably friendly environment, but please feel free to ask your questions as critically as you would like and give us the opportunity of, of discussing some of your concerns, either about what SIMC is doing and intending to do generally, or if, if you want specifically about the arc med arc clause, we'll think of a nattier way of putting it might be quite right, but it is an invention of which we are extremely proud. Has anybody got any questions that they would like to kick off with? John, John Bishop, John, for those of you who don't know, was the senior partner of Vincent Mason, is now effectively the Vincent Mason partner who runs the China operation and controls a huge amount of litigation, arbitration, and mediation that comes from probably, I think, the biggest employer in the world when you think that China State employs over a million employees. John, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I can soften the question slightly so that you might think you're among friends, but knowing you, uh, what is your question? John, without actually a question, but as you said, I work uh, mainly with Chinese SOEs. We have in China, uh, in China, almost no experience of the kind of mediation we're talking about today. But um, in the last two or three years, we've had two or three mediations which have been very successful. They've been because various senior people in Chinese companies have been prepared to take the gamble of something new, which is not always a good thing to do if you leave the China. Yes, and uh, there's now the word is spreading in China. So I'd just like to say that at the start because um, it seems to me that the timing of your great initiative couldn't be better for us in, in China. So thank you very much for that. Um, we do also in China have some experience, I don't because I don't practice Chinese law, but Chinese companies do, of, of arbitration that moves to a conciliation process because it's embedded in our law, in their law in China. I think explaining to Chinese companies 
the um, head of the process uh, may be a challenge. I've had the challenge of three years explaining mediation. So trying to explain arbitration and mediation in this format may be tricky. But the questions that will be asked will be, how expensive is it? Is this not a more costly exercise? There are two exercises now. Isn't this just going to cost more? Is it really efficient? Once I've prepared the arbitration papers, why don't I just let it go on to get a decision? And finally, are you sure that I can enforce the decision? Is somebody going to say, because we do it in China, when somebody tries to enforce a decision against us, oh yeah, I didn't get due process, because I didn't say everything I wanted to say in the arbitration. So I don't know if you could help me with those three in selling this process in China. John, thank you for all of that. I think it's a hugely important point, which I know has been expressed as a concern by many people. Lawrence, could I pass it to you first of all, please? Thank you. Yes, I think the question that you asked uh, bring us really to the very product that uh, SIMC has come forward with. Thank you. <coughs> has come up with. In fact, this is the very first product that we are talking about, the AMA arbitration, uh, arm, met arm. The situation that you've experienced in China probably is when they have commenced arbitration and they go through a process of conciliation and they fail to go back to arbitration. Yeah. Uh, so that is, uh, but it's not a structured format. What we have, uh, as I see, have come forward uh, to uh, this particular product is A and A, up and up. In that you commence arbitration and it's stayed for, for a while, maximum, I think the rules provide for eight weeks maximum. And then um, you revert back to arbitration only if you fail to succeed. But if you succeed in mediation phase, in other words, within the eight weeks, and um, an award can be entered into by consent, and that becomes enforceable. So this, by this process, it addresses three things, the three elements that you have identified. Firstly, how more expensive it is. It's no more than more, not more expensive than if you have gone through the full arbitration. In fact, it will be much cheaper, because the stage in which is transferred or stayed for the purpose of mediation is when the, uh, uh, the response to the uh, uh, request for arbitration has been found. So it's a very early stage of the arbitral process, and you freeze it for stay for eight weeks maximum, and the settlement is achieved. That's all the costs of arbitration that you have uh, you would have incurred. So there's saving of expenses. Yeah. The other one is timing. How much time do you lose, or how much time to consume? A maximum of eight uh, uh, eight weeks is all that has been would have been spent. And picking up from what uh, uh, Mike was sharing earlier about. To, uh, the uh, two success stories and seven and one funeral, and the, also the uh, question that the uh, uh, folks were in the legal, uh, the, the expectation of parties in terms of timelines. I add that, add that up. Actually, you're talking about in terms of SIC rules, 30 days, 30 days, and uh, uh, another 60 days. We're talking about four months. So it is uh, a settlement could be achieved in an AMA situation within four, maximum five months maybe, if all goes well. So uh, that addresses the time issue, right? So I think this, this formulation that uh, C SIMC has come forward is an innovation that is, um, addresses also a very important legal question. There are a lot of institutions that talk about MEGA, so you go to mediation, and then if you fail, you go to arbitration, and, and there are some institutions that provide for arbitration, and then you go to mediation, but here we have, a situation, if, if you have a uh, mediation that's settled, so it's a man up situation, then how can then you commence arbitration? Because in order to have an enforceable award, you need, under New York Convention, existence of a, a dispute. If a dispute has been settled, you cannot technically commence an arbitration. Because some, you can't have an, uh, 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 create a, uh, a dispute when there's no more dispute, it has been settled. So a met up situation does not produce an enforceable award. Whereas an up met up in the formulation that we have proposed in SIMC would achieve that desire, overcome the issue of the legal problem of enforceability. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Tassidy. Could you pass to Siokui? Can you, from our, our commercial point of view, answer that, Siokui? Actually, the benefit of having uh, someone as knowledgeable as Lawrence go before me is he said everything that in so I can just nod and, and agree. But I'd just like to add one little point um, on the China thing. I think 
we've made very clear in our rules that in the art med art process, the mediator and the arbitrator will be two different people. It will be separately appointed by the um, registrar of the SIAC, who is sitting at the back there, I mean. And um, in SIMC's case, a mediator will be appointed separately by SIMC. And unless parties agree, this will generally not be the same person. If I could say quickly, on, on, I would not underestimate the value of being able to get a consent award. I mean, people often think that you can just quit, go, if you're in an arbitration, it's easy to get a consent award. It's not. It's actually very complicated. Um, because you know, think, for example, I don't know how, I haven't tried to work this through the map of how the, how SEOC would handle it, but we had an ICC arbitration where we tried to reach a consent award, but then you've got the ICC court, which is interposed. You've got the fee calculations and everything. The arbitrators have to be compensated. I mean, there's a lot. We had to amend our, our, our contract to let, you know, to take it out of ICC and have ad hoc arbitration. And then there was a complication where our mediator, we asked him to sign the consent award. Our mediator was Bill Marsh, great mediator in London. And Bill said, the mediator's room will appreciate this. He says, um, I'm not qualified as an arbitrator. Bill. Nobody's qualified as an arbitrator. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, very much. And you can see that the, the holy grail that we've been looking for for some years was a mediated settlement that was New York Convention compliant. We are the only organization that has found the answer to it. Others are frantically trying to copy it. <laughs> <laughs> so we call it the Singapore clause. Eh? And it is already in use. It is already being adopted already as I speak. It is an innovation. We are extremely proud of it with very good reason. It will not materially add to expense or time. It is a huge benefit. Lawyers won't like it much for obvious reasons, but the less said about that, the better. The clients will endorse it enthusiastically. Thank you, John, for the questions. Next. Gentlemen, could we have some comment about what happens when the parties agree on, a, on an outcome that wouldn't normally be the subject of an award. Yes, we're very conscious of that. Thank you very much, because of course one of the benefits of arbitration, one of the benefits of mediation is you can, you can provide benefits that are not justiciable. A lot of the things like goodwill, continuation of employment, continuation of business relationships. We see no problem in there being side agreements which are not part of the enforceable award. In order to be New York Convention compliant, the award, properly so made, after there has been a settlement, will have to contain only that which is justiciable. But I don't think we envisage any problems. <coughs> Lawrence, outside and beyond that, is there any reason why, as mediators, we should feel inhibited from providing the sort of extra mural, extracurricular benefits that we're used to providing? There should not be any limitation or restriction on a mediator in the AMA situation to prescribe, not prescribing, to uh, assist the parties in coming up with solutions that are not otherwise justiciable or enforceable as a in the form of a consent award. What, the, what would happen is the uh, mediated settlement would be passed on to uh, the uh, CIC, SIC, with a request that the arbitral tribunal, which was already a cons constituted, make an award as best it can based on the uh, consent uh, agreement of the parties. That which is possibly enforceable will then be uh, formulated in an award. We also have in our rules, in our protocol, uh, make a provision that uh, whatever agreed in the uh, settlement agreement will form part of the pleader case and, uh, 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 within the jurisdiction of our two tribunals. So there, there won't be a situation in which you file a claim for a million, uh, $10 million and uh, in the course of the uh, mediation, apart from settling the $10 million claim, there are other ancillary issues that are brought in mediation and therefore it's technically outside the scope of the reference of original claim. So by uh, adopting the protocol, we have expanded the jurisdiction of tribunal to include those claims and agreements reached in mediation. So again, we, uh, we have covered those areas. Mike, from the, from the consumer's point of view, would you have any concerns about a mediated settlement that was an arbitrable, enforceable award that didn't cover all aspects of what I might call the, the non-justiciable elements? Would that put you off the art medal? No. Thank no. you. <laughs> so if you anything about additional. Uh, two things. I just wanted to make a slight correction. The, uh, the appointments of arbitrators at the SIAC are made by the president of the court. Uh, it's just because um, I saw Eileen in the room and I thought, well, that's Graham, well, let me talk about Eileen. <laughs> but uh, I think Eileen wanted to say something a little bit about consent award, perhaps, as well. Right. 
yeah, this basically I think um, the process, just to address uh, Mike's question, is, is such that um, SIC will stand as the one-stop shop. We will have we have the finan uh, finance department that will do all the initial collection advances. So a party seeking that up and up will do will give us the deposits that will be channeled off for, to SIMC. And in terms of uh, once the appointment process is done by SIC, the file will actually be passed on to SIMC, <coughs> and the arbitration is stayed for as long as I said eight weeks. That's how it works. Now, assuming a consent uh, settlement agreement is reached and parties do wish to uh, translate that to a consent award, that draft award technically should come back to us, right. right? And we would go through the normal standard SIC scrutiny process, which I think most people know is pretty fast. Uh, it doesn't go through the entire court. It's a two-stage process where it will be funneled through a council, the SIC, who will check the terms of the settlement against uh, what was the initial notice and response file. And what we anticipate, because this is actually a new procedure, is that we will work very closely with Francoise and Eunice from SIMC. And uh, that was the reason that Francoise was formerly a member of our team as well for many years. Um, so she's very familiar with the scrutiny process. And I, I do uh, envisage that we will have a bit of overlap in the scrutiny process. And that will then channel off to me, or my deputy, for an uh, next level. So that process is usually uh, pretty fast, uh, because it is a consent award. We will not, uh, we generally for consent awards, we cannot reopen the settlement because sometimes that would destroy the settlement, right? So we will usually a maximum of maybe one or two weeks. And then costs will be done simultaneously. You know, you know, the, the, I think what you're, what you're pointing out though yeah. is, is how complicated the, 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 the infrastructure has to be below this to get to a simple process on top and why this is not being done anywhere else, why you need to have mechanisms like these in place. In right. order to be able to propose something like, and have something that's really viable. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's why everything runs at the same time. The right. moment um, I anticipate, the moment the settlement agreement is reached, the council will tell us the cost determination process will start. You know, and basically there's yeah, there's not much cost because all that we would have done in that scenario is uh, accepted the notice, considered it, uh, made appointment, right? And by a certain point, we know roughly how much of that cost will be allocated to us. SIMC will have to coordinate uh, coordinate their billings with us. And that would uh, generally accompany the award in that two or three weeks that we take to review it. So I, I think in, in the past when we've had consent awards, uh, the common trend has been that we move faster because we know that we need to strike while the settlement is hot. <laughs> <laughs> we've had many instances where a consent award came in at 6.41 and they said, we need this scrutinized now, two hours. And we do the best we can because we know that it, uh, we really need to get parties agreeing with the, to the terms. And we try not to interfere unless it's really important. Uh, something that perhaps the parties didn't consider that may affect the enforceability of the work. So I don't think it will be a very complicated process because um, we, are, we are quite efficient in how we do it. Yeah. You are extremely efficient. SAG is, uh, in my view, the best uh, 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 arbitration administration in the world, second to none. I don't think it's following Europe, I think it's leading it. And we are hugely lucky in sharing not only the cooperation between the staff, as evidenced by what Eileen has said about our own staff and about ourselves, but for those of you who haven't yet visited, you should, just the floor below in our little office, there is literally nothing that separates the two offices. There is an open door through which Sir and others walk on a regular basis. So there could not be closer cooperation, spiritually or physically, between those two organizations. No one else in the world can do that. Uh, sorry, Dan. Thank you, um, Danny McFadden, CEDA. Um, as most of us know, CTAC uses Ahmed, Nadab, Ahmed, whatever we want to call it. Now, CTAC currently allows for the mediator um, to be separate, to have a separate mediator and a separate arbitrator. Uh, CTAC also allows, I think it's Article 19 or something, uh, allows mediated agreements to be converted into awards. Um, I, I called them once and I said, well, what does that mean? And how, how long does it take? <coughs> Excuse me, and how expensive? And they said, well, take about three weeks and it's, we envisage it won't cost too much. And I said, well, what does review mean? And I haven't quite had an answer to, to that question yet. Um, so uh, that's, what, that's one thing. And I, well, I suppose my first question is, what is the difference between what CTAC offers and uh, what you will be offering, but the second part is, um, will you, 
um, review the mediation agreement and what, if you are going to do it, what does that mean? And how long will it take for a mediated agreement to be converted into uh, an award? Ross, would you like to take that first? Maybe I can't answer for, I can't answer for SIC. Anyway, I think I can speak louder. <laughs> um, your first question about CTEC. Um, the traditional CTEC uh, method of, is to have the uh, same set of arbitrators hearing the uh, arbitration and then mediate the matter. And then if it settles, make an award in the course of the arbitration as part of its duty as an arbitrator. Because of its dramatic influence, it, it, they, it, they do that kind of thing for many years. This process that um, you have suggested that uh, CTEC is doing, allowing parties to go out from mediation and coming back, is something new. Yeah, it's something new. Yeah. And your question of whether or not they can, um, they, they are agreeable to have uh, mediation agreements being converted into awards. That question, if, if it is without commencement of uh, any CTEC arbitration, purely and map up situation, I think you'll suffer from the enforcement issue under the York Convention. Yeah, so that is a, remains a problem. If it is within the CTEC, um, the new uh, process in which they allow it to be out for mediation and come back for arbitration, I think that will be, uh, that will be something quite similar to what we're doing here. Yeah? The uh, other question you have is uh, how long and what's the benefit of scrutiny and, uh, it takes for the award. Here you are. When the uh, an award, when, when a consent, uh, an agreed mediated settlement is to be converted in an award, what it requires is for after tribunal to be satisfied that it falls within the jurisdiction of the arbitration agreement or the agreement of the parties. It also has to ensure that some matters, which are uh, uh, to ensure that the relief or grants in, made in the award are enforceable by law, justiciable. Uh, or is make sure that no third party interests, for example, are, uh, are impacted or affected by the agreement of the parties. It's not a, an agreement uh, to be converted or award so that third parties are, are, are in any way affected. It must not be against public policy. So these are questions that the arbitral tribunal will, has, will have to apply its mind to when, it, when a party comes forward with a settlement agreement. So, but the SIC registrar will have a different role. There's this merely on form and a procedure to make sure it's uh, adhered to and the rules are complied with, the protocol is complied with. So their check is different from what the arbitrator's role is. The does have a role. It does have a role. It's not just a rubber stamping. To assure those lawyers to see that, you know, this can't be a situation in which the tribunal just rubber stamp anything that the, uh, the parties will come for it to uh, rubber stamp and make it an award and terrorize the world with the award. So we want to make sure that that system, that uh, those checks and balances are in place. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to add to that? Time for perhaps one more. Where are we? Yes, uh, Sarah. I'm so sorry. Either. I mean, in order, one, two. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But, um, I'd like to address uh, the uh, issue of uh, enforcement of mediated settlement awards. From what we understand from today, um, the uh, proposed Mediation Act will provide for mediated settlement awards, mm -hmm. rather, mediated settlements to be enforceable in the same manner as a court judgment. And mention was made that UNCITRAL is considering this. Well, uh, the paper was tabled by the US delegation in UNCITRAL in New York in uh, June of this year. Uh, it is still not on the UNCITRAL agenda. It is being proposed for the UNCITRAL Working Group on Arbitration and Conciliation. But the Commission has not endorsed that particular initiative yet. But of course, the fact that the paper was proposed led to some uh, corner discussions among various delegations. And the questions were asked as to how far does this extend? Now, coming from GE and big corporations, where normally you're involved in big commercial disputes, it does make some sense for a mediated settlement to be enforceable, because normally mediated settlements are in the form of a quantified sum. So there's a quantified sum. But mediations can be settled in any number of ways. Uh, for example, I had one instance where uh, mediation was, uh, the mediation resulted in a settlement which was a quantified sum plus a jump of beer. 
in uh, in Gavin's case, for example, uh, the settlement was not just uh, compensation, but also getting his job back. Eh? And I wonder whether this can be enforced in the same manner as a uh, judgment of a court. But I think with respect, that was the point, wasn't it, that Jeff raised. There will be non-justiciable elements which will still be enforceable by private contract. The huge advantage that we think that we've got, and that nobody else has, and not for the first time we beat down such a way, and Central takes a little bit of time to catch up with the SIMC because the SIMC is an infinitely more efficient organization. Than the front. <laughs> Nobody is surprised that they're lagging behind. We have already got an enforceable system. The, we, the reason that we've got it is we ensure that there is a real dispute at the time it goes to arbitration. That dispute is referred to mediation so that when it comes back for the arbitration award to be made by consent, there is a dispute at the time when the arbitration came into existence. So the old objection and the problem that SEAC ran into of having a sham arbitration award because at the time that the arbitration award was made, there wasn't a genuine dispute, it was all over. That's why the importance that Eileen drew attention to as well, and Lawrence, there has to be a bona fide dispute at the time that the arbitration is commenced and then, then adjourned or stayed and referred to mediation so that it's valid. But it's a valuable point. Thank you for reinforcing it. You Sarah, know, my last so 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 you know uh, no, you're, you're not right. to, uh, This is not the point. It is not enforceable as an arbitration award. The proposal is that it be enforceable as a mediated settlement. Yes, it is. It is. A the mediated settlement, the part that is mediated settlement, may have justiciable elements in it, like a sum of money. It may have non-cooperation, non-rubbishing non, non clauses in it as well, which are not justiciable. All that we are saying, all of us with one voice, is that the justiciable parts that are capable of being enforced as an award, New York Convention compliant, will be. Those that are not, obviously we can't wave a magic wand over, but they will be as enforceable as they always were as an immediate agreement. I don't think we can take any further than that. Siram, I'm so sorry I kept you waiting an awful time. No, 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 no. I'm a variation doctor on ARBNET. Sometime back, the Chief Justice appointed me as the arbitrator, to told the parties, tell him I also want him to function as mediator. So you can't disobey the Chief Justice. So we worked out something with consent of parties. I sat as arbitrator, we had four sessions. I then wrote out the essence of the award, put it up on the signed it, sealed it, the parties council signed it. Thereafter, I said, well, we are now in mediation. Whatever you would say to me, your disclosures, they're not going to affect the award, the award is there. For four days, council went to and argued on the rate of interest. He said, I need 20%, the agreement says so, you can't dilute it. In mediation, I said, where are you in interest? It took him two minutes. He said, give me 10%, I'll take it. Defendant, six months he wanted damages. Where are you? Three months. We settled within half an hour, 15 minutes more to draft the agreement. And I think there is an advantage because parties know where they are in arbitration. They know what the arbitrator knows. The award is there. It can't be varied. They are free to make disclosures. So I think it's an interesting variation. One last comment, Michael. If you had asked somebody in India how long arbitration takes, <laughs> normally, eternity. <laughs> it's expedited. It's expedited, one generation. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, and we can have an offline conversation about my experience with arbitration in India. Um, <laughs> By the way, one, we had one case where the Chief Justice uh, this, uh, Chief Justice was appointed as a replacement arbitrator, and its arbitration in its eighth year all of a sudden settled in that year as soon as he came on board. So, <laughs> different value. Um, what I want to say, I would point out, the, the UNCTRAL convention that's being discussed, I think, is, it illustrates the challenges also that you're going to face here in Singapore with this initiative. Because it's true, it is not yet on the UNCTRAL agenda. It's a proposal that's up there. It is facing fierce resistance from the old guard of the international arbitration community. Who, who know or, or feel yeah. that this is a, is a threat. And I don't expect you're going to see them getting on board with an initiative like, the, like this one. But parties are strong. In fact, if you look at these disconnects, you'll find parties are heavily in favor of it. And, and why is that? Well, if you go back 50 years when the New York Convention was, was signed, where was international arbitration? It was practically a ground zero. Where is it today? It's a booming industry. So what, what does a convention like this do? Res irrespective of the legal implications, what help, will it not help, is it will promote international mediation. 
So I, I expect we're going to see a war on that, and we'll see how it plays out. I think just to follow, I think uh, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Chan uh, did say, did mention that uh, this paper has been highlighted or uh, raised by the U.S. Uh, and I think you agree that it will take time, right? At least 10 years before anything real will come next forward. Year, I think. Next, year, yeah. next year, will it be on the agenda and yeah, how long will it take? Yeah. Efficient, huh? well, uh, we, hope, we hope that, because actually that will be a positive development. If actually there is a convention or even a model law on uh, mediator settlement agreement, it will be a great leap of faith by those, uh, by a lot of people. You know, it will be good if then it really is, uh, and also to pick up on the mediator arbitrator arbitrate mediator situation. Of course, in many jurisdiction we are uh, we are at least those of us who come from common law jurisdiction. We're very afraid of the this uh, hybrid uh, or, or, or monster called the arbitrator mediator. But in your case, I think you are the angel. You are able to help them with it, and they are very happy that magic works. But it, it will be a tough one. I have actually personally tried arbitration as an arbitrator and sitting as a mediator and reverting back when it was not resolved is very difficult. It is a very, very difficult one to split your, uh, your personality, uh, taking different roles in the same, uh, with the same parties. In your case, you, you, you take the magic and you settle it, and that's very good. Yeah, but in, may, in those cases, for chance, you don't settle what will happen. Yeah, what you've heard, can, are you like judges? They can erase it off their memory? Yeah, we are mere mortals. It's very difficult for us. Lawrence, I'm huge to be able to do that. Until the Chief Justice arrives, there are only two people I'm really frightened of in this room. Uh, there's the Chief Executive, Sue Kui, sitting on my left, and there's Eunice Joe sitting in the back of the room, and there's no way I'm going to come between those two and survive, so I'll do what they're both frantically gesturing at me. We're out of time. I would like to thank the panelists very much, but they would also like me to thank you for showing such an interest. We do believe you've done a good job. We're very proud of what we've produced. We are not complacent. We are waiting for your criticisms and hugely anxious and willing to discuss them with you uh, with genuine modesty. So please use the rest of the time to attack us and speak to us privately, um, and we'll try and respond. Other than that, thank you all very, very much for your participation. Um, can you just tell me, I'm out of time on where we are next to Eunice, or, or, or when and where are people coming now? Thank you. Okay. Wrapping up now. In that case, you can tell us where we go from here. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody and thank you Edwin and our panelists.